Okay, good morning, everybody. So I just wanted to let you know that I am recording this particular class. Uh, this way has a, a couple of reasons. One, this way in case I need to go back, if I feel like I missed something in one of your presentations, I have the ability to go back. I will post it on YouTube. I'm going to use it as part of my portfolio. I hope that you'll use it as part of your portfolio that you can snip the videos as needed. Um, I also like to share them on Twitter because all the projects have been really great so far. And finally, because I do ask if you guys saw in the post last night, I'm asking everybody to create a quick Flipgrid video as a response to any project other than your own. I max the Flipgrid to 90 seconds. You don't have to use a whole 90 seconds. There's four parts to that that video review, you're going to just say your full name and class period because I have all three classes mushed under one topic and it'll be easier for me to navigate when I have that information. Then you're gonna tell us the team name of the team that you're reviewing. And finally, an area that they did really well and you thought that it was impressive and then an area where you feel like they could grow. So um, I that's another reason why I post the video for you guys so you have access to that. The way today is going to work is um, when the teams start to go, you will have the 10 minutes. I'm assuming you guys will manage your time, but if not, I will cut you off at the 10 minute mark. I'll let you guys know and I'll ask you guys to stop sharing. Just a quick note on sharing to avoid any mishaps. When you click to share your screen, whoever's doing that, there are two buttons, radio buttons at the bottom that often go overlooked, but you need to click those, especially if you're sharing a video or anything with sound, otherwise we will not be able to hear it. So make sure when you click to share the screen, there's a dialogue button uh, screen that comes up and you click the two buttons at the bottom, then share your screen. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat. This way we're not interrupting the presenters. Otherwise, thank you guys. I look forward to amazing presentations and Anna Kustmos, you're up. Just to make sure you can see my screen, right? Hello? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. Today, our group will be presenting on Hinduism for our myth presentation. Scholars often date Hinduism believed to have started around 2300 BC or to 1500 BCE. Hinduism, Hindus, on the other hand, believe that their faith has been timeless and has always existed. That is due to Hinduism being a fusion of various beliefs with no founder. We still can't make an exact estimate, but one thing we do know is that it is one of the oldest religions that people still believe in. Actually, the terms Hinduism and Hindu are fairly recent de developments, and this religion goes under the name Sanatana Dharma, which we can translate from Sanskrit to mean natural or eternal way. The final goal of Sanatana Dharma is to achieve moksha, which is enlightenment and rebirth which can be done through a virtuous life, material prosperity, and emotional fulfillment, otherwise known as jhana, bhakti, and karma. Now that you know the origins and goals of Hinduism, I'll pass it on to Elsie to speak about the gods. So we have the Trimurti, also known as the Triple Form. We have Brahma, the creator, Vishnu, the preserver, and you have Shiva, the destroyer. He, Shiva represents death and dissolution, but he's also a master of death and new generation. He's the one that shot down the three indestructible cities that inflicted tyranny upon the gods. You have Vishnu in his concert. So Vishnu, he's known as the god of preservation and the great maintainer. He represents the principles of order, righteousness, and truth. Lakshmi, she's the goddess of beauty, purity, and domesticity. She's also the goddess of good fortune, wealth, and prosperity. Sazvati, she's known as the goddess of learning, music, and poetry. You have Avatara. They are various incarnations that descend, uh, of God that descend down to earth to provide salvation for humanity. Krishna and Rama are two very popular ones of Vishnu. Krishna represents infinity and eternity, and he's the one who subdues the serpent Kaliya. Rama, he's the god of truth and virtue, and he's the perfect embodiment of mankind. You have other important goddesses to know. So you have Mahadevi, who is a concert of the principal male god, and she encompasses the local goddesses. She's also the one that contrasted with Shiva because the masculine consciousness is powerless without female creative energy. Durga, she is the slayer of Mahisha, the buffalo demon. She is the avatar of the mother goddess 
Parvati, and she represents the fiery powers of gods. She is the protective, righteous, and the destroyer of evil. Kali, she appears terrifying and destructive, and she is also the goddess of death because she represents the march of time towards doomsday. So other important gods to know, you have Ganesha. He's the remover of obstacles, and he's a god of good fortune. He's the son of Shiva. Hanuman, he's the symbol of physical strength, perseverance, service, and scholarly devotion. He's the one who's aided Rama in the battle versus evil. And now gather around for a campfire story. Story time. Speaking of time, time is a cycle in Hinduism, so there's no beginning and there's no end. Our tale starts somewhere in the middle. Vishnu was lying on a serpent in the ocean, as you do, and one moment he dreamt of creation. From his navel burst forth the lotus flower, and in its midst, Brahma sat. Brahma is the creator, which is ironic since apparently he wasn't in the beginning, but since timelines don't really exist, there never really is a beginning. So when Brahma wakes up, the universe begins. When he goes to sleep, it ends and it starts over again. Shortly after birth, Brahma splits the lotus into the heavens, earth, and sky, and from his body, he takes a piece of himself to create the male and female. There are many versions as to which body part he took, so that's up for your interpretation. But he also creates creatures, but they were secondary to humans because we were absolute units. Thus, the world and those that live in it come from the Trimurti. Okay, end of story. Someone put out the fire. It's time for some fine art. As said before, time is cyclical and there isn't one single creation story. For the art piece, we chose the story of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva because it was the most common. Brahma and Vishnu definitely have four arms, but Shiva's representation can vary between two to four arms. The reference we used had two arms and we used it because it is the simplest way to display him sitting. The reason for this difference is because artistic depictions portray him with differing number of limbs and heads depending on their view of him and his powers, and some use two limbs only because it allows them to have a human-like image to devote themselves to. Okay, um, you guys can hear me, right? Uh, lotus flowers represent nature as well as Brahma's birth. He was born from a lotus flower from Vishnu's navel. Vishnu was sitting on a serpent because he was laying on the serpent of eternity before the lotus flower and subsequently Brahma were sprouted from his navel. The background holds the most symbolism. The sky represents the cyclic nature of the Hindu creation story. The day starts with Brahma, continues with Vishnu, and ends with Shiva to start again the next day, or cycle in this metaphor. Another symbol is water, which is important in Hinduism because of its role in the creation of the universe. It represents the material of the universe and cosmic energy, and water holds great importance in Hindu rituals to honor the gods. The ocean is also reflective, which reinforces the idea of purity in the water. We portray the three gods to be sitting in the ocean because it's supposed to represent their part in infinite creation. And now Nicole will talk about modern society. First off, we're going to see how Hinduism relates to Christianity. And so on the surface, when you look at Christianity and Hinduism, it seems like there's no, absolutely no um, similarities. But actually, the Hindu concept of the Thimurthi is parallel to the Christian concept of the Trinity. So Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva would be similar to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in Christianity. And now the role of Krishna and Jesus are also very similar because Jesus was sent to earth as the savior of humanity. And Krishna was sent down to fix evil and the imbalance of Dharma in the world. And also Catholicism worships Virgin Mary in the same way that the Hindus worship the cult of Devi. Uh, when we compare it to Greek mythology, we see that um, other than the fact that they're both polytheistic religions, just like in uh, Greek mythology, we have the deadly sins. Hinduism also has the seven deadly sins, which are Kama, which is lust, Krutha, anger, Lobha, greed, Moha, attachment, Mada, pride, and Matsarya, which is jealousy. Also, uh, which considered to be revolutionary for their time, women were seen as goddesses and they each had their own powers and worshipers. And Hinduism can be seen as a Hindu theistic religion, which I'll discuss in the later slide. When you compare Hinduism to modern society, uh, Everyone knows about yoga as a very popular practice. And it was actually first mentioned in the Oja sacred test, which is the Rig Veda, which is as a spiritual discipline for uh, worshipers of Hinduism. And it aligns your chakras, which are the various energy centers in the body that correspond to specific nerve bundles and internal organs. And also the poses in that we do in yoga are based on Shiva's sacred dance poses, which he would use to end the world and restart the, ne the next cycle. And also in modern society, uh, we know the concept of manifestation, which is actually a Hindu concept, which uh, transforms your theoretical thoughts into reality based on the law of attraction, which is a belief that positive or negative thoughts correspond with positive and negative experiences in a person's life. And the fact that um, the universe conspires to make everyone's dreams a reality. The caste system is often very misunderstood in Hinduism and uh, we think it's responsible for the prejudices in modern Indian society, but actually the caste system, which is referred to as Varna, was actually never um, mentioned in the 
the original scriptures, but rather it was based on a person's ability rather than their birth. But this changed after the creation of the Manu Smriti. And the Manu Smriti were a series of documents that um, established that the Brahmins would be the head of the caste and that they could rule over the lower caste system. And Hinduism even mentions a third gender, um, even though it's indirect in the religious text. And they believe that the third gender um, uh, it was favored by the gods. So for example, being gender fluid or transgender would be ha would be mean that the god gave you divine powers or insight. Now, finally, Hinduism on the surface, we think that it is a polytheistic religion because they have over 33 million gods, but it can actually be argued as being monotheistic because they believe in one being or creator, Brahman, who is worshiped by different names. And all these gods that Elke talked about are manifestations of that one god. And that, so I think the more accurate term to describe Hinduism would be henotheism, which means the worship of one god without denying the existence of other gods. And so basically it's monotheistic in principle, but polytheistic in practice. And it allows people to believe in and pray to their own conceptualization of the divine in whatever form they choose, but at the same time, elevating all of them to their ultimate reality, which would be the beauty of Hinduism. Now that the presentation is over, we would like to invite you to take this five question pop quiz and you will be able to view your scores afterwards. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, guys. All right. If uh, Team Teen Titans is ready to go, we'll have you as a, an 11.13 start time. Is it working? Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay, sorry. I've been on mute this whole time. I'm not sure how to use this. Um, so Teen Titans, oh, good morning, everyone. Teen Titans did the Chinese creation story. In our presentation, we'll be exploring the yin and yang, the cosmic egg, Pangu, and Nuwa and Fushi. On the sides, you see our artistic piece, but hopefully later on in the presentation, you'll understand what it means and we can explore it further. Now to begin our presentation, let's watch the video. First, we have the man who created the heavens and the earth. According to an ancient Chinese legend, the creator arranged Pangu and other divine beings to create this universe in a unique dimension called the Three Realms, which was especially made for human beings. Pangu created this world by splitting over an egg he was sitting in. When he broke open the egg, the top of the egg became the sky and the bottom became the ground. Then the goddess Nuwa created people. She did this by modeling them after herself using clay by a riverbed. The people she molded by hand became rich and beautiful and powerful. But Nuwa found that this took too much time. She got a little lazy. So she took a vine, dipped it into the mud, and flung drops of mud in all directions. When it touched the ground, each drop of mud became a separate human being. Now, after human beings were first created, they were helpless against Earth's natural elements. So other gods descended into the three realms one by one to help them. Okay, so the video talks about yin and yang, which is an ancient Chinese philosophy on the concept of dualism. It describes how seemingly contrasting forces are actually inter interconnected in the natural world. <clears throat> Although seemingly opposite, yin and yang are, com are complementary and interdependent. 
as shown at, by the black dot on the white surface and the white dot on the black surface. Yin and yang is relevant in Chinese religions as Taoism embodies the yin and yang principle as a representative of how life should be lived in balance. The yang represents masculinity, light, activity, heat, the sun, life, and movement, while the yin represents femininity, darkness, death, stillness, the moon, and pacificity. We can see the yin and yang re representatives in everyday life, how when there's a fourth, there's a back, and everything is relative to each other. An example of this is when you grow a crop, it's yang, but when you harvest it, it's yin. So in Chinese mythology, the entire cosmos, chaos, and yin and yang were all scrambled within a cosmic egg. And inside the egg, there was also Pangu, who eventually broke free from the egg once the yin and yang became balanced. And parts of the broken egg became our universe. For example, the light egg whites floated up to become the clouds, stars, skies, basically the heavens and the heavy egg yolk sank down to form the earth and the ground. And this creation story is really similar to the Big Bang Hypothesis, which theorizes that all matter was compacted into a very small ball or singularity. And the singularity then expanded, and once it cooled, the atoms, stars, and galaxies all formed. And just like in the creation story, the whole universe was compacted into one ball or egg. And this, the creation of the universe was only achieved once balance was achieved, and it all began with nothing. So we wanted to pose a question for you guys. From a structural perspective, how does this compare to other cultural creation stories? Bella? Um, I think that it's actually very similar to other creation stories because uh, I don't know, in Hinduism, uh, we chose the lotus flower uh, creation one because it was the most common, but there are actually versions where it wasn't Brahma like bursting from the lotus flower, but it was actually a golden egg that he bursted from. So I think that's kind of like cool to see like these relations and how like egg is like a symbol of like birth because it is, you know, a place of birth. And I feel like it's kind of cool to see these in different uh, cultures. Exactly. And um, uh, Rico is going to go over the next slide with Pangu and it's really similar to what you said. Okay, so as Angel said in the previous slide, Pangu is the first being and of Earth and also the creator of the world. Um, he's characterized as a short horned hairy beast and he was created by the first union of yin and yang inside the egg. His name is separated into two roots. Pan means to coil and Gu means ancient. And that's because Pangu slept inside the cosmic egg in a curled up position until he finally woke up. And when he woke up, he stood up and he broke the egg in half, like the video said, and from inside the cosmic egg, he released the universe. There's many variations of the Chinese creation story, but one thing remains the same throughout. And that's the presence of Pangu. He's always, he always has to contribute to the creation of the universe. However, even though you might think he might be one of the most popular deities because of the, the creation of the world in Chinese mythology, he's actually not as well known as the other deities, and that's because he doesn't have any descendants or children to pray to. However, Pengu is still celebrated in today in an annual festival held at Pengu King Temple in Guangdong province. Similar to um, in, in Christianity, how Christians go to church to pray and to receive blessings, Chinese, uh, Chinese people do the same in Taoist um, temples as well as Pangu's king temple in Guangdong. In all the stories, Pangu is accompanied by his four celestial friends, the dragon, the turtle, the phoenix, and the chilin, as you can see in the photo. Now, relevant to Chinese culture and celestial symbolism in general, what do you think each of Pangu's celestial friends symbolize? You can just call it out because I can't see the raised hands. Based on what I remember, I think they represent like the four directions, north, south, west, and east. So, um, yeah, so the dragon is um, power and strength. The phoenix is rebirth. The turtle is longevity. And the chilin, which you can often see at the gates of Chinatown or um, in other Chinese regions, they're actually symbols of protection. So uh, as we saw in the video, Nua is considered to be the mother of all mankind. After all, she created humans. 
uh, while going for a walk in the woods, she was overcome with loneliness and started to make clay figures from mud, as shown in the video as well. Through her marriage with Fushi, she invented the idea of marriage and reproduction, which is why women who experience marital affairs or fertility issues pray to Nua. Nua still holds a major influence in Chinese culture, especially in music. As seen on the picture to the left, she's holding a reed pipe, which she invented, which is why many Chinese musical theaters hold paintings to honor her. From a feminist, feminist critical theory perspective, how does Nua represent the ideal woman of society? So uh, we might be running short on time. So, for, so Nua represents the ideal woman of society because her main purpose is really to, uh, to get married and to reproduce. Uh, like we mentioned on the last slide, Fushi is the brother and husband to Nua, and Fushi is one of the most beloved deities who greatly cared about the humans and also set the laws of humanity. In the beginning, there was no moral code or social order, and Fushi united men and women, regulated the five stages of change, and laid down the laws of humanity. He had also devised the Bangwa or the eight trigrams to gain mastery of the world. The three symbols of the trigram, which you can see in the picture on the bottom uh, right corner, uh, there are uh, three broken or unbroken lines that symbolize the eight fundamental principles of reality, which are heaven, earth, water, fire, wind, thunder, mountain, and lake. And this is especially important in Chinese Buddhism and feng shui because of its key philosophy of balance, which also relates to the yin and yang. And although Nuwa is uh, directly credited in creating humans, Fushi had assisted with her with it. However, he did teach them uh, all the necessary skills to ensure their survival. He taught them how to cook, how to fish with the net he invented, and how to cook with the weapons made of iron that he also invented. And he is also credited with the domestication of livestock because he believed that it was a much more practical and energy saving to keep the animals around for milk and meat and labor than it was to hunt them. So we have a quiz for you guys that you can do it on yourself because all the answers are on the slides anyway. So we want to move forward to our um, artistic piece, which is our Instagram page. So first, enjoy our original meme. So it's actually eleven twenty-three. So we're we're ready for Team Four. Um, excuse me, Team Three, Medusa Snakes. Okay, so this is Myrna. Okay, so our group had our presentation on the Egyptian creation myth. And then to start off, we're gonna show you guys a video explaining the creation myth. Kat, I think the thing is, okay.
Um, wait, so can you hear me? So the ancient Egyptians believed in deities and the mm. extended family of of nine deities produced by autumn during the creation of the world. None was the dark beginnings of the world representing four pairs of deities split evenly into male and female. Each couple represented a principle which was invisibility, directionless, darkness, and infinite water. Autumn, also known as Shu representing dry air, Tefnut representing moist air, our life, and justice. Shu and Tefnut then produced their offspring, Geb representing land and Nut representing the sky by breaking them apart. From Geb and Nut came Seth representing this order, this order, Osiris representing order, and Nephthys, who was the goddess of air, and Isis, who was a powerful sorceress and healer, and she was also the mother of Horus. Then we have Agdo, the chaos that existed before creation. The world began with four pairs of deities representing chaos, with males being frogs and females being snakes. There was none, Nonet representing water, Amin and Aminet representing invisibility, Het and Hawet representing infinity, and Kek and Kalkets representing the darkness. And Need and Agdod are two versions of the same story, and the differences lies in the number of deities and how they are symbolized. Okay, so basically the eyes of Horus, they were one of the biggest parts of the story and they were, there were different versions, but there was a sky god, right? Horus was the main sky god, I guess. And the right was Rays or, or known as Adams in some stories, which is the sun gods. And the left was Thoths, which was the moon gods. And there's, uh, there's different names for it, like the Weja or the Uja. And they're kind of known as the eyes of wholeness. They symbolize different things. They symbolize the ability to see, act, or protect. They symbolize healing. And in order to restore itself to its rightful owner, it's, it means to restore balance and order and stability in a society. So basically, there are many stories on how the eye created humans. So one of them says that the eye separated from Ray and it would not return. And so his offspring, Shu and Tefnut, they struggled to retrieve it. And that led to the eye to shed tears and that created humans. There's also another story where the eye wandered off and Thoth, the moon god, went to search for it. So when the eye came back, it was discovered that it was actually replaced by another eye and it was angry. So it instead took place on Ray's brows in the shape of the cobra goddess, the Uraeus. And that's what pharaohs used. They used, um, they used to put a symbol on their brows in order to show their symbol of authority and in order to show their connection to Ray, the sun god. So another version also says that, that Shu and Tefnu, you know, the children of Ray, they were lost in the waters or the chaos, also known as none. So Adam sent the eye to search for them and their return caused him to cry tears of joy and that created humans as a result. And there are many other versions that include the eyes, like for example, it being torn out and they also represent the cycles of the moon or potentially a solar eclipse. Okay, so some other meanings of the eye in include the symbol of rebirth. So for example, after Osiris was given the eye as a gift to rule the netherworld and ate it, he came back to life. Uh, many other times, offerings to the gods were named the eyes of Horus because gifts would become divine. So the eyes also used as measurements, and when broken into six pieces, each would represent one of the six senses. Uh, Rey's daughter would also be given the name the eye of Rey, so which many times in many times she presented herself in the form of a cat, thus defending Rey. And some even said that the cat would heal bites from snakes and scorpions. And in fact, in one story, the eye was sent as a punishment. The, the eye was sent to punish mankind as a lion. So Rey was so shocked by the devastation that he dyed 7,000 jugs of beer red with pomegranate juice and stayed in the ground with it so as to sh show itself as blood. But, and the eye which feasted on the blood, it ended up sleeping for days before awakening and thus ending its reign of terror. Okay, so next is our physical art piece. Um, so today, like we have a clay carving. So uh, in, this, in this piece uh, represented, we have like, if you look at it, it seems like the left, but it's the right eye, you know, facing backwards. It's the eye of Ray. Um, and we also have Geb and Newt. And if you look, like Newt is portrayed in many Egyptian paintings and sculptures as a, um, as a, like a woman who reflects the ocean. So the whole setting is above uh, waves. Um, Newt is represented as being over Geb. Geb represents the land. Um, so then that's why we have the ocean, Newt and Geb, and Newt is over the ocean. Um, 
So next I'm going to go deeper into the meanings of the differences between the eye of Ray and the eye of Thoth. So uh, for the eye of Ray, that's the right eye. It's the sun related and it also represents masculine or um, yang energy. So this eye is more about exploring things like reason, mathematics, logic, science, language, stuff of that nature. Um, it is mainly used as a symbol of good luck and creative action. Now, in comparison, the eye of thought, the left eye, is feminine or yin, yin energy. And this is more about exploring things of like humanities, human nature, emotions, magic, intuition, and sexual energy. And this rather is a symbol of healing and uh, protection. So like Kat mentioned before, the eyes of Horus represent how much of our energy is spent on the six senses. So for example, half is spent on smell, um, a quarter on sight, an eighth on thought, a 16th on hearing, a 32nd on taste, and a 64th on touch. Um, so we were able to make many connections to modern culture because a lot of the creation myths do tie into the modern world and kind of connect the timeline. So um, especially in Egyptian mythology, there was a really um, big emphasis on the search for balance in the universe. And um, there's always conflicts between the good and the bad and the light and the dark and kind of a struggle for power in between them. And also in Egyptian mythology, the sun is a symbol of enlightenment and light, which is also seen in later religions and cultures, especially um, for example, the Roman, the Roman culture and Roman um, history, a big theme was sun monotheism, which led to the holiday um, Sol Invictus, which was celebrated on December 25th, which was obviously taken over for Christmas in Christianity. And also seen in the Old Testament, Genesis 1 describes an empty and dark earth with God introducing light to separate the water and land from the sky, which is also seen in Egyptian um, in the creation story as Shu separated Newt and Geb to separate the sky and the earth. Okay, so a major belief of the ancient Egyptians was the belief in the afterlife. This relates to many modern religions such as Christianity and Islam, and also through traditional practices such as mummification. Uh, the ancient Egyptians gained knowledge about the human anatomy and preservation, which influenced modern medical knowledge. Uh, the ancient Egyptians also made note of medical illnesses in their scripts and the scribes as um, an influence of evil spirits and angry gods. Um, they saw the king as a person of offering uh, to the gods, which relates to the modern theory of divine right, which many kingdoms still rule by or have ruled by in the past. There have also been many analogies between the myth of Isis and Horus to the myth of uh, to uh, Virgin Mary. And then to end off our presentation, we have a quiz. So these are the five questions and we uploaded the quiz on Google Classroom. So thank you guys for listening. I mean, that means you guys should be setting up to go because it's 11.35 now. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I thought, uh, okay. All right, we're group four and um, our creation story is the Japanese one. And this slide is supposed to say uh, the, the Pantheon. Izanagi is a primordial god who brought order to a sea of chaos with his sister and wife Izanami by creating many islands. And we're going to talk about this more in a creation story later. But many deities were sprung from his cleansing, which is why cleansing is an important ritual before entering sacred shrines. 
Amaterasu Ohira is a daughter of Izanagi and Izanami and was born when Izanagi washed his left eye. She is a goddess of the sun, queen of the heavens, and is believed to be the ancestress of the imperial household of Japan. She serves as a little rising sun, representing the movement of day and night and nourishment of all living creatures. The Japanese imperial family claimed descent from Amaterasu, and they use their position to ensure that she is always queen of the heavens and her control of its courts and representation of order and enforcing justice is reflected in their rule. Tsukuyomi is a god of the moon and he was born when Izanagi washed his right eye. He married his sister Amaterasu Ohira and the marriage signified the union of the sun and sky and the sun and moon in the same sky. However, at a feast held by Ukemochi, a food goddess, he killed the food goddess and Amaterasu was disgusted by his actions and decided to move to another part of the sky, which is why the night and day are completely separate. Okay, uh, next we have Sam, the god of the sea and storms. His um, chaotic moods and disabled, disabled um, parents reflects his status as um, god of storms. Um, he was born with um, when Izanagi washed his nose and was, um, was banished from the heaven because of his chaotic moods. Um, next, we have the goddess of dawn, mirth, and revelry. And he, uh, she's the sister of Sansu and serves for Amaratsu. She represents jivality, creativity, which connects to creation and happiness, often associated with sunrise. Then we have uh, Yabetsu. He's the god of luck and fisherman. He was Izanagi's and Izanami's first primordial child who was before, um, born in a deformed state because of a transgression in the marriage ritual. Um, he was born without bones and casted away at the age of three into the ocean. He grew through various um, hardships by himself, thus becoming the patron god of fishermen, children, and most importantly, the god of um, fortune and wealth. He's one of the primary deities of the um, seven gods of fortune, influenced by uh, local folk folklore and not foreign influence. He's also the god of jellyfish. Um, then we have um, Inari, who's the god or goddess of agriculture, mostly rice, commerce, and swords. He's often portrayed as dual gendered. So, um, yeah. So she's associated with uh, prosperity, agriculture, and um, food surplus. Uh, she or he is the descendant of Sansu, and she's often depicted to have the head of a fox or with foxes and sometimes uh, depicted as an old man. In Shinto tradition, she is associated with good spirits like the goddess of the kitchen or the god of goddess of food. And then lastly, we have Hachiman, um, god of war and divine protector of Japan and its people. He exemplifies the synchronism between Shinto and Buddhism as he's known as Bohis, he's also known as Bohista, a Japanese Buddhist deity who is um, the guardian of several um, shrines in Japan. Next, we're going to do the um, the story of Japanese creation, and this is also our um, art form. Okay. In the beginning, there was darkness. Before there was an earth, a of darkness was a magic all things. From the dark, light formed called in yin, and the dark force would be called yo yin. From these forces, it's and Izanami being the female who invites. They were looking on the bridge of heaven and they looked down into the darkness. They asked if heaven beneath us. We threw a into the water and the island of the plant together. We went north and south and walked for months. When they finally met in the middle, Izanami was this he was the man and he could think so they would do it again Um, Raquel is having technical difficulties right now. Okay, so they walked in opposite directions for months again. Like the first time, they would meet on the other side of the world, Axel. 
Now when they met in the middle, it was Yuzunagi who was the first to speak. What a beautiful woman I've met, he said. As the in force, a piece of my body is missing, she said. As the yo force, a piece of my body is excess, he said. They completed each other and became one as husband and wife. Their first child was the island of Ahaji. They made six more islands and called them the Great Eight Islands Country, Japan. Izanami gave birth to Ohohiro Minumuchi, the sun goddess. She was so radiant, she ruled in heaven. Tsukiyumi was the god of the moon. He ruled at Ohimi Ohiro Minomuchi's side. Together, they produced many more children who were gods or elements. They were happy for many years. Their last child was the god of fire. During his birth, Izanami was burned to death and sent away to the underworld. Izanagi then left all of their children to live on the island of Tsukuji, where he grew, grew old and lonely. Now we're going to talk about the connections. Uh, we're connecting it to Christianity, specifically the Bible, uh, the first book of Genesis. So the theme of female punishment in the Japanese story can be seen as Izanami spoke first uh, when she and Izanagi crossed paths. And then she is punished by this, and um, her first son is bon born boneless and, and ugly, and they abandon this child. And this can be seen in the book of Genesis, as Adam and Eve are told not to eat from the tree of knowledge. And Eve is manipulated, which results in them getting banned from the Garden of Eden, and Eve is specifically made to feel more pain during childbirth. So in both these stories, women are punished, punished for being disobedient, disobedient, curious, and assertive. Um, there's also a theme of female dependence on men throughout both stories. In um, the Japanese story, Izanami says that she felt like her body was not complete, so Izanaki gave her excess body parts, which made her complete, and like she be grew dependent on him. And similarly, in the book of Genesis, God created Eve from Adam's rib, so if Adam's rib would not have been taken, the woman would not have been created. So as we've seen both of these stories, women were solely be complete because of their male counterpart and dependent on men throughout their entire lives. And as we examine these stories through a fe feminist critical theory, we see the common theme of women being inferior and dependent on men and punished if they are like seen to be assertive or out of control. And we have a quiz on Google Classroom that you guys can take, it's a Google form. You have two minutes. I'm not sure if you want to uh, review the quiz with the class or if you want us to continue forward. Um, we have some questions that are like gone throughout the presentation. So can we go back to them? Because like we were having technical difficulties and we weren't sure if we were yep, able to. Absolutely. Yeah, because you have until 1145. OK, so we wanted to ask what other connections to different cultures can people draw from our comic book story of creation? Anyone? Okay, no. Um, does anyone want to answer what connections can you draw from the Japanese Pantheon to that of the Greek? I mean, like, you have, like, your two main gods and, like, goddess. So you have Izanagi and Izanami, and you also had Zeus and Hera, and they were kind of, like, the symbolism for the kind of, like, the typical marriage as well. Yeah, definitely. They're both the two, like, head rulers. I mean, you also have deities that, like, oh, sorry, I'm really close to Mike. Um, You also have deities that, like, um symbolize just, like, aspects of everyday life i remember there was like the the god slash goddess of agriculture and the god of war and stuff like that and i thought that was like also similar to the greek pantheon yeah definitely okay it's uh, 11 45. so we'll have a we'll do a start time of 11 46 for achilles with no heel Okay, so we're doing ancient Sumerian culture and talking about their creation, their gods, and how their humans were created. So for their creation, in the beginning, there was a god, Namu, and he lived in total darkness. But then when he gave birth to Anki, Anki was the god of the heavens and the earth. 
Anki gave birth to Enlil, who was the god of who was the god of air. But then Enlil split the universe in two. Because Anki was the god of the heavens and the earth, when Enlil split it in two, Anki was also split in two. So now he had now he had the god of the sky on and Ki, who was the god of the earth. Ki gave birth to a child. Ki gave birth to a child with Enlil, and their child was named Enki, who became the god of water and the lord of the universe. With the water that he took from Namu, Enki created the Tigris and the Euphrates River that flowed through ancient Mesopotamia. Sumerian culture is based around Mesopotamia because that's where the majority of it was, that's where it was located in the ancient culture of Mesopotamia in that place. And the rivers were the essential bodies of water that found in ancient Sumeria. All right, so now I wanna talk about the major Sumerian gods. So An, otherwise known as Anu, was regarded as the Lord of the Skies, his subtitle being Father of All Gods. And he was set to confirm the kingship of rulers as his word was supreme. Enlil, the Lord of the Air, generated great floods and droughts as he was the Lord of the Sky. And he was a mediator between God and man. In one tale of Enlil, he was arrested for seducing Ninlil, who was the deity of destiny and his consort, and he was banished to the underworld for this. So Ninlil looked for him in the underworld, and every time they met, she would bear a child, and their firstborn was Nana. And we have Enki, known as a god of magic, mischief, crafts, and creation. So there's tales of Enki getting goddesses drunk and having children with them. Nevertheless, he's considered benevolent as he helped create men and has saved them from time to time. Um, Marduk was the uh, patron god of Babylon, and basically his power was kind of tied to uh, Babylon's power. So like as it rose in status, he did too. And he was also associated with the planet Jupiter. And um, sometimes, uh, and he sometimes has been told is making his followers uh, make build the Tower of Babel, which is uh, described in the Bible. And uh, Nana was known as uh, the heart, he whose heart cannot be read, and he could see farther than every other god. Uh, he, he was the god of the moon. And uh, whenever the moon had an eclipse, this was seen as evil entities trying to steal his light. Um, he was the firstborn of Enlil and Ninlil, and he's seen as a shepherd and the god of shepherds. Uh, Atu was associated with life, justice, divination, and the netherworld, and he was the sun god. And so he was believed to ride through the heavens in a sun chariot, and he could see basically everything, and he enforced divine justice among the gods and uh, helped those uh, humans in distress. Um, Ninma, or uh, Ninhursag was associated with pregnancy and childbirth and was basically like the fertility god or the mother god and was associated with wombs as well. Um, she guided children when they were still in the womb and fed them after they were born. So in this slide, we're going to talk about the creation of man. So at first, before there were men, uh, labor was done by the minor deities in order to serve the major deities, but uh, they were initially digging ditches and working in the farms, but the minor gods were tired of the work and they went on strike, so they decided to burn their tools and surround the temple of Enlil, and that obviously caused distress with Enlil, so he needed help from Anu and Anki, and they decided to create human beings, so with the help of them, Anu and Anki, they decided to create human beings to work as servants to the gods and to labor for them. And human beings were made as the servants to the gods. And the gods sacrificed, they decided to sacrifice Geshtu in order to create this mixture. And Geshtu was a god with great intelligence. And with the help of the birth goddess Nimma, they created a mixture. This mixture was created by mixing the flesh and blood of Geshtu with clay and the spit from each god. And Nimna ex uh, decided to impregnate herself with the mixture. And in the end, the mixture created seven men and created seven women. And it was created after nine days of being injected with the mixture. And this actually led to a celebration where the creation of humans caused a celebration in Sumerian culture that celebrated for nine days after a child's born. So 
so the art piece that I drew shows the creation of man. The story is uh, drawn from right to left. On the right is Ninma, the goddess of birth. She is holding the sacrifice Geshtu. And next, next to Geshtu is Anu. He is carrying the mixture of the God, all the gods spit and the mixture of flesh from Geshtu and his blood. And then next to him is Enki, who is mixing the mixtures and giving it to Ninma. So it's a cycle from right to left. The tree next to Ninma is has has nine branches of leaves, which represents the nine days which Ninma was pregnant. And uh, so for the modern collection connection, uh, I wanted to connect it to um, to the Bible and specifically Genesis, because one of the biggest myths in um, the Sumerian creation is um, this great flood myth where all of the gods together decide to allow a great flood, who, which is coming to, to wipe out humanity and decide not to stop it. But then they start to feel remorse and decide to allow one person to uh, build a great ship and they instruct him to do so the, and fill it with animals. And this is really, really similar and possibly inspired the, um, the story of Noah's Ark in Genesis. And there's a lot of other connections Can anyone else hear Matthew? Because I think he might have had technical difficulty. No. So oh, I'll, just, I'll just finish his um, uh, presentation where he was talking about how he uh, connected it to current like Christian religion through the story of Noah's Ark and how other elements, especially the book of Genesis, were inspired by the Sumerian mythology. And they also included stuff like the Garden of Eden and there's also other parallels with the creation of the world through the pre state of primordial chaos and eventually culminating in the creation of man and wildlife. So we also have a video that we would like to show you. So let me get, let me pull that up. And while you're watching the video, you could also look through the quiz as well. Yeah, we also have a quiz posted on Google Classroom. Before time began, there was only darkness and the goddess Namu, the primordial sea. She gave birth to Anki, the universe. At first, they were heaven and earth in one, a vast mountain of soil and sky mixed together. Anki produced Enlil, the air. Enlil separated his parents into An, the sky, and Ki, the mother earth. He pulled his mother down to form solid ground and pushed his father up to form the heavens. He then created the moon god Nana, who created the sun god Utu. Enlil and Ki, air and earth, joined to produce Enki, the god of water, vegetation and wisdom, and the lord of the universe. Enki gathered together part of the primordial sea and squeezed it into the rivers Tigris and Euphrates. He caused there to be cattle on the earth and fish in the rivers. He built marshland around the rivers and made the soil rich and fertile. Meanwhile, in heaven, the gods were having a lot of... Hi guys, sorry, it's 11.55. And uh, we could have Imagine Dragons ready to go for an 11.56 start. Yes. Um, so we are group six. And before we start with the video, if you could please prepare www.kahoot.it on maybe like another slide so that we can start the quiz after the video.
Anyway, so we did our project on Polynesian mythology, and here's a video we created to explain. In the beginning, there was a giant shell. The top half was a sky ranchy, and the bottom was the earth papa. They were the parents of gods, humans, and all life in the world. They loved each other very much, holding on to one another and Close the grace and refusing to let go. They gave birth to six gods Tahiri Matia, god of the winds, Tate, god of the forest, Tu, god of war, Tangaroa, god of the sea, Raku, god of peace, and Wu, god of fear. She began to grow. There was not much room inside the shell, and blood of the light in space. The children began to resent being confined between the parents' bodies. So they plotted to separate the parents and bring back the world as we know it. The six sons could not agree on the best way to separate the sky and the earth and quarreled violently. One son suggested killing the parents and Tuahiri Matia opposed separating them all together and refused to take part in the plot. However, eventually managed to prize Manji and Papa apart. He did this by lying on his back and forcing the shell open with his feet pressed upwards, just as a tree has its roots in the earth while its stem and branches stretch towards the sky. Manji and Papa were finally separated, and the sky and the earth have remained apart ever since. Tahiri Matia, the god of winds and storm, was furious with his brothers. He could not bear to see his parents being torn apart and decided to make his way between Manji and Papa. He promised his brothers, however, that they would forever have to deal with his fury. So from time to time, he sends storms, whirlwinds, thunders, and lightning to the world as a reminder of his anger. When the space between the earth and sky was wide enough, the sons decided to make humans. They worked together to mold people out of red clay. When they had finished Cain, God of the Forest took the figures of man and woman and pressed his nose to theirs, breathed the spirit of love into their lungs. The humans' eyes opened, they sneezed and came to life. Papa and Ranji were proud of what their sons had created, but they still missed each other's touch. And so every night Ranji cries, and in the morning the world is dead with the dew of his tears. The morning mist on Papa's sighs with sadness as she thinks of her beloved Ranji, now separated from her embrace. And that is how the world was created. All right, so next we have a Kahoot and um, I'll put it in the chat. The code is 116 Is everyone in there?
Okay, congratulations, Eo. So our connection to modern day themes in humanity and in regards to authentic authenticity and different variations, being that Polynesia is made of more than a thousand different islands scattered throughout the Pacific, there are many different versions of the creation story, in part because of tribal groups, language dialects, and also because historically, these stories have been preserved orally for many years before they were physically documented. So while the names um, like of the creation story might differ from every like island, um, the story is mostly the same and um, people would add new characters or new events to suit their new environments of every island, such as Hawaiian, Samoan, and Maori groups. In the myth, concepts of humanity and philosophy are timeless and enduring. Human traits in regards to flaws are exemplified in the children's selfish desire to break free from their parents' shell. By doing so, they are separating their parents and hurting them, but as in customary in life, children will grow and mature to eventually find their own paths. The purity of humanity, such as parental love and unconditional love, are also exemplified, as, Rang as Papa and Rangi were still proud of their children, even though they had hurt them. There is also the selflessness of Tohi Tawiri Mati, who stood up passionately for his parents. Just as each god held a different opinion on how to break out, it is a process of growing up as people develop their indivi individual identities. When the children do break free, they open up a new world for humanity to flourish. These humans, in accordance to the natural world they were formed from, learn how to adapt to the challenges of their environment. They soon master these seas, navigating the oceans and migrating to new islands all while bringing their cultures with them. Today, Polynesians still place a heavy emphasis on their connections to the earth and have remained in touch with their origins after years of European colonization. In recent urbanization developments, now younger generations will have to define their own contemporary indigenous identities in the modern world. So now we're open to discussion. If, you, if anyone has anything to add, maybe some similarities to other, you know, uh, cultures, religions, or if you have any additional information on Polynesian culture that you would like to add, we would like to hear them. So it's actually 12.06, um, well, which concludes our, our projects.